Hi, I am Medical Shark and today we are going to derive two formulas which may look hideous at first glance. The first of them is the angle sum identity for basic trigonometric functions sine and cosine and the second is Heron's formula for computing the area of a triangle from the lengths of its sides. Both of them can be derived in a pretty straightforward manner and these derivations are even elementary. The only thing needed is an understanding of complex numbers. So, I would like to start with this topic. Actually, one of the purposes of the video is to show how handy they are. But I think that they are usually explained a bit improperly. The usual introduction to complex numbers is motivated by a desire to perform the square root of negative numbers and followed by a construction of an algebraic theory. And then somebody tells us that the algebraic theory satisfies geometric properties. But it is not clear at all how a geometry suddenly appeared here. Advanced teachers can satisfy inquiring students by referring to the angle sum identity for trigonometric functions. I regard such an approach as absurd. True, in history, mathematicians discovered complex numbers by playing with the square roots of negatives. But if we spot tentacles of a creature somewhere, we don't have to take those tentacles as the core of the creature. So since mathematicians already know what complex numbers geometrically mean, let's introduce them in such a way. I think I don't have to explain the real line very much. It is a line containing every real number. Zero is at something like the middle, positive numbers are on the right, negatives are on the left. Every point corresponds to a real number. And this is what complex numbers look like. Every point on the plane is a complex number. Here is a complex number. Here is another. This complex number is by coincidence even a real number and is equal to 3. Simple, isn't it? Sure, I haven't said several important things yet. We usually want to perform arithmetical operations on numbers. We would like at least to be able to add them or multiply them. We have, say, these two complex numbers. What should be their sum? or their product. We begin with addition, using an inspiration in real numbers. One method for visualizing real addition uses row composition. We interpret every number as an arrow from zero to that point. And when we want to compute, for instance, two plus three, we just put one arrow onto the end of the other. By composition of such arrows, we get the result in this case, it's equal to 5. And we'll do the same with complex numbers. We interpret them as arrows and compose them. To be precise, for the sum u plus v, we shift the arrow from 0 to the point v so that it begins at the point u and the sum u plus v is the tip of the shifted arrow. If you've seen addition of vectors before, there is no difference. I would like to remark that this transition between a point in the plane and a vector that's a straight line from zero to that point will be seen even in the next parts of the video. It will sometimes be useful to see a complex number as a point in the plane that's something with fixed position and zero size and at other time it will be better to see it as a vector that's an arrow with a fixed direction and size, but with a variable position. In that case, we can talk about the length of a complex number. It is denoted by the absolute value. If we have a complex number as a vector and we want to find an appropriate point, we have to shift the tail back to zero and then the appropriate point is at the tip. Addition is done. 
Let's figure out multiplication. This one is a bit tricky. It's not clear what the product of two general complex numbers should look like. That's why we will simplify it at first and answer the question how to multiply u by a real number. 1, for instance. Well, that's just u. Or 2 times u. That's still simple, just stretch its length 2 times. Or minus 1 times u. It is just u reflected around 0. And so on. It is not very difficult to multiply u by real numbers. But now comes the trick. Instead of seeing the picture in the sense that other numbers multiply u, we will follow how multiplication by u transforms the real line. Well, the real line is rotated by the oriented angle near u, and then it is stretched or squished according to the length of u interpreted as a vector. We can naturally generalize it now. If we multiply the complex plane by u, it's rotated by the oriented angle between u and positive reals, and then it is multiplied by the length of u. So what happens with a general complex number v? Well, the angle of u is added to the angle near v, and the length of v is multiplied by the length of u. This can be summed up so that complex multiplication adds oriented angles and multiplies lengths. If you are used to the algebraic introduction to complex numbers, you can still have a feeling of a missing proof. And indeed, I do not claim yet that this creature has anything to do with the algebraic view of complex numbers. But there is nothing to prove yet. We just used addition and multiplication of real numbers as an inspiration and introduced addition and multiplication of points in the plane. It is just that we usually require some nice properties from addition and multiplication. We want it to behave on the real line in the usual good old way. When adding several numbers together, the ordering of summons shouldn't matter. The same should apply for multiplication. It is usually not difficult to realize that these conditions hold. If you wish, pause the video and think it over. Just the fourth point is a bit more mysterious at first glance, so we will look at it in more detail. It says that we can expand brackets. We will see it in a simple example. u times v plus w equals u times v plus u times w. We are used to it in the real numbers. It can be justified by a double measurement of the area of one rectangle. In complex numbers it will look different, but still quite simple. So let's look at it. The left hand side tells us to find the sum v plus w and then multiply the result by u. We don't have to draw u in the picture. It suffices to know how the multiplication by u looks. And the right hand side tells us to multiply v and w by u separately and then sum it together. Well, it's obvious that the result is the same, isn't it? Because if the sum of v and w is v plus w, then although the sum of the rotated v and the rotated w is rotated v plus w, and finally the stretched v plus the stretched w gives us the stretched v plus w. So u times v plus u times w gives u times v plus w. Speaking in academic language, we could say that both rotation and homotety are linear transformations. If you need to think it over, please pause the video. I am moving on. Once we have complex numbers, we can finally look at the important but not necessary tentacle of it, the imaginary unit. We want to find a complex number such that when it's multiplied by itself, 
the product is minus 1. The number minus 1 as a vector has length 1, so the length of the required number has to be 1, because multiplication multiplies lengths. And since multiplication adds angles, such a number has to sit on a line perpendicular to the reals passing through zero. To be honest, complex numbers have actually two tentacles. One is pointing up and the other one is pointing down. We will denote one of them as i, the imaginary unit. And it doesn't really matter which one, we can denote as i the bottom one and it will work the same as if we denoted the upper one as i. But it is customary to denote the upper one as i, so we will stick with it too. Now we can ask what to call the bottom one. Nope, minus i. Then there is one extra feature of the imaginary unit. Whenever we build a complex number of the form x plus yi, where x, y are ordinary real numbers, we get a complex number at the coordinates x, y, where the real axis is understood as usual as the x-axis, and the axis in the direction i is understood as the y-axis. Conversely, since every point in the plane has some coordinates, we can express any complex number in such a form using i and two real numbers. At the end of complex numbers, we return to the algebraic point of view. We don't have to know the geometric background to be capable of computation. It is necessary to know that they satisfy the usual properties for calculations and that every complex number can be expressed in the form x plus yi where i squared equals minus 1. So suppose for a moment that that's all what we know about complex numbers and we want to multiply two of them. Well, what is a complex number? The only thing we know now is that we can write it in the form a plus bi where a, b are reals. The other can be written as c plus di. So when we need the product, it suffices to expand these brackets. If you are doubtful about the expansion of two sums, I can tell you that the simple expansion example we have shown a while ago is general enough to cover any expansion you like. Just use it repetitively. And for those of you who like to pause and ponder, I have here the geometric interpretation of the performed expansion. The algebraic point of view is not necessarily wrong. Even examples of the use of complex numbers which we are going to see are about some tricks with expansions. We introduce them in a geometrical way mainly because it is simple to verify algebraic properties from the geometric definition, while the opposite direction is rather weird. And the result is the same, our structure satisfies both of them. This is the end of the introduction to complex numbers. Let's see the applications. We start with the angle sum identity for sine and cosine. So let's recall the definitions of these functions. We construct a segment in the coordinate system from the origin to the right and then we rotate it around the origin by an angle alpha counterclockwise so that the end point other than the origin remains on the unit circle. Then the sine of alpha denotes the y coordinate of the endpoint and cosine of alpha denotes its x coordinate. It is rather difficult to compute the sine of an angle, but we could do it if we knew the sines and cosines of other angles, which altogether gives the desired angle. In general, assume that we know sines and cosines of two angles, alpha and beta and we want to compute the sine and cosine of the sum of these angles. We could find appropriate formulas under the name angle sum identity for the sine and cosine, but here we will show how to derive them immediately, so you will not have to memorize it nor search for it anymore. 
Since we know both the sine and cosine of the angle alpha, we can determine the complex number at the appropriate endpoint. And the same holds for beta. The unit vector at angle alpha plus beta is exactly the product of these two complex numbers. We are interested in sine and cosine. They denote the coordinates of the product. So all we have to do is to perform the same expansion as the one we've seen recently. So these are the mysterious angle sum formulas. All right, that was a warm up. If you are struggling with the geometric behavior of complex numbers, rewind the video and think it over. We will continue with a real problem. Let's take a triangle with sides A, B, C. To make the final formula simpler, we define little s as the half of the perimeter and we would like to derive Heron's formula looking like that for the area of the triangle. We could try to compute the altitude using the Pythagorean theorem and then express the area as half the base times the altitude, but in such process we would lose the only nice thing about Heron's formula, the symmetry in ABC. So we will use the encircle instead. Let's denote the inner radius as R and divide the perimeter of the triangle into six parts using vertices and touch points. I know, it may seem as a random construction so far, but bear with me. It will soon make sense, both connections to Heron's formula and to the area of the triangle. At first, we notice that these parts of the perimeter are pairwise equal. When we tilt the triangle so that its vertex is exactly above the incenter, the whole upper part of the triangle is symmetric about the vertical axis. So these two upper segments are equal. We denote their length by x. Similarly, we denote the length of the segments on the right as y and those on the left as a z. We can find the first connection to Heron's formula. The whole perimeter is 2x plus 2y plus 2z. So the weird little s actually denotes the sum x plus y plus z. What's more, summing two of those segments gives a side of the triangle. So since little s is the sum of all three, we can express x as s minus a. And the other sides are analogous. And we can find these expressions in Heron's formula. We are on the right path. So let's really compute the area. To do that, we join the incenter with the vertices. So we divide the triangle into six little right triangles. We can rearrange them into a rectangle and then we can compute the area as width times height. We know its width x plus y plus z in the sense that we can easily compute it from the sides of the triangle. It just remains to compute its height, aka the inner radius. This will be a little trick, so let's set up a plan. First, we will make an observation about some angles. Then we'll rewrite this observation into complex numbers. From the complex formula we extract an identity involving r, x, y, z. And finally, we express the inner radius. Here we go. Just as we divided the perimeter into six parts, we can divide the angle around the incenter. And again, these angles are pairwise equal. The two angles opposite x are equal, the two angles opposite y are equal, and two angles opposite z are equal. It means 
that it is sum of one angle opposite x, one angle opposite y and one angle opposite z is a straight angle. This is our observation about angles. Let's rewrite it into complex numbers. After we place the blue triangle so that the inner radius is at the bottom, we can interpret the inner radius as the real number r in the complex plane. Since our triangles are right, we can express the segment of length y as the complex number yi. So the blue angle is the angle between positive reals and complex number r plus yi. The other two angles can be expressed in a similar way. The sum of those angles tells us that the corresponding complex product is a negative real number. In other words, it's a complex number of form something plus zero i. We don't care about the question mark, but the zero near i is exactly what we are going to build on. It tells us that after the expansion of the formula, the coefficient near i has to be zero. So let's expand it and follow the coefficient near i. It will be simpler than it looks at first glance. Taking r from each sum we get r cubed. It is real. We don't care about that. Taking r from two sums and something times i from the other gives i times r times the something. So we get three terms. r squared xy, r squared yi and r squared zi. Now take one r and two terms of form something i. The product of these two i's is minus one. So we get a negative but real number. We don't care about it. And finally, when we multiply only terms with i's, we get two of these i's multiplied to minus one. So the result is minus x, y, z. The coefficient near i has to be zero, so we have an identity in r, x, y, z. Complex numbers have done their job, we will not need them anymore. The rest is just a routine calculation. We want to express r, so we put constants to the other side, factor out r squared, divide by the coefficient near r squared and take the square root. To calculate the area, we just multiply r by the sum x plus y plus z and this is Heron's formula. Well, almost. To finish it, we have to recall that the sum x plus y plus z is actually s denoting the half of the perimeter and that we can express a particular x, y, z as s minus a, s minus b and s minus c. Voila! But this time it was a bit harder. So let's recapitulate what happened. We have divided the triangle into six parts using in radii and segments joining vertices with the in center. We have denoted lengths of the parameter as x, y, z and expressed them using sides of the triangle. There remained the problem how to compute the in radius. To solve that, We've made an observation about angles and rewritten that to the language of complex numbers. It has led to an identity concerning variables r, x, y, z. So we have expressed r and the area of the triangle. So I hope it was understandable and that you have taken something from it. What do you think? Do you remember enough to be able to derive Heron's formula? or at least the angle sum identity by yourself. In the very end, I would like to mention the author of the animation library which allowed this video to happen. It is a YouTuber, 3 blue one brown and he has made a lot of other beautiful animated videos about math. So if you haven't heard of him, definitely check his channel out. And that's all. Bye.